Hi there, my name is Jason Harlow. In today's video will go through the main points of chapter 6 from Wolfson. So there are six sections to cover. Uh, energy overview, introduction to work, and you can see the picture there of the guys climbing a mountain. They're doing uh, work against gravity as they go up the hill. Uh, work as an integral, so we'll be talking about calculus today. Uh, kinetic energy, and lastly power, which is work per time. And if you look at the quote above, energy is a fundamental aspect of the universe, a substance akin to and every bit as real as matter itself. It's a very important concept in physics, and I think I want to actually start with cons conservation of energy. So the law of conservation of energy is that energy cannot be created or destroyed. It may be transformed from one form into another, but the total amount of energy never changes. And if you follow uh, six, figure 6.2 from your textbook, uh, this shows how to apply the law of conservation of energy. The first step is to define a system. So here's a big collection of objects. We might draw a boundary around this guy and his umbrella, and, in, and that defines that he's the system and the umbrella. And then everything outside that boundary is called the environment, and this is all these other things. So within the system, there can be different forms of energy. There could be kinetic energy, there could be potential energy, there could be thermal energy. And uh, these types of energies can transform back and forth between one another, but the sum of all the types of energy within the system will remain constant. Unless there could be energy in from the environment, uh, or there could be energy going out of the system into the environment. And this could be in forms of work or heat. So let's give a quick example of sources of energy. So if you think about the energy in your phone, well, you plugged it into the wall, that power came from Toronto Hydro. Much of uh, Toronto Hydro's power gets uh, generated by uh, generator turbines in waterfalls such as Niagara Falls. Well, where does that motion of the water come from? Well, it comes originally from the sun. The heat from the sun evaporates water. Uh, water will fall down as rain at high ground. Rain flows into rivers, and the rivers eventually turn into waterfalls, uh, which turn the turbines. The wind, and also you have uh, wind power, which also is coming from the sun heating the earth unevenly and turning generator turbines. So most of the energy uh, that we use here on earth is originating somehow in the sun. And you can even harness uh, the energy directly with photovoltaic cells on rooftops or uh, in solar farms and convert it to electricity there. And you should know that more energy from the sun hits the earth in one hour than all the energy consumed by humans in an entire year. So this is, this is our source of energy, and it is, a, it is a big one. But let's back up. Okay, so let's start with the simplest, most basic form of energy called work. Work, in its simplest form, is force times distance. So we can write... W for work equals F sub X times delta X. So two things are going to occur every time work is done. It's an application of a force and also the movement of something by that force. The SI unit of work comes from this equation. It's force in newtons times distance in meters is newton the newton meter, or newtons times meters. This is given its own special name in physics. It's named after James Joule. It's called the Joule. So this guy might be doing work on the car by pushing it along, and I've added some little drops of sweat to his, his, his brow there. So let's do a quick uh, test to see if you've got it. If you push twice as hard against a stationary wall, the amount of work you do so quadruples, doubles, remains constant but not zero, remains constant at zero, or is halved. Think about that. Press pause. When you're ready, I'll tell you the answer. So of course it's zero, So and it doesn't matter how hard you push against something, if that thing is not moving, there's no distance, uh, delta x is zero and the work you do is zero. So even if you feel like you're you know, sweating, you're not actually in physics doing any work, you're not transferring energy to that object. So some examples, this guy is pushing the car along some distance, and doing work is the force he pushes uh, times the distance is the work that the man does on the car. Here a woman is pulling her suitcase. She's doing work on the suitcase. But you can see the force that she pulls with is now at an angle 
uh, relative to the displacement of the suitcase. The suitcase goes horizontally uh, along the x-axis and her force is uh, has a y component as well. So uh, the work done only depends on the x component of her force times the displacement. Uh, and if there is no x component of the force, then you say that the work done is actually zero. So as this uh, waiter is carrying the tray uh, along at a constant velocity, his force that he pl uh, applies to the to the tray is directly upwards, whereas the uh, displacement is, is 90 degrees away uh, towards the right. So you say he does zero work on the tray. So uh, work can have a sign. Positive work means that the displacement and the force uh, are both in the same direction, or the force has a component in the direction of the displacement. You can also have negative work. That is the case where the force has a component that is opposite the direction of the displacement. So the way this can happen is if an object, for example, has an initial velocity towards the right, and then the force you apply is towards the left. You would say, actually, the, in this case, the object is doing work on you, so you would say that you do negative work on the object. So quick question for you. Which of these following situations has the net work done on a soccer ball positive? A, you carry the ball out of the field, walking at constant speed. B, you kick the stationary ball, starting it flying through the air. Or C, the ball rolls along the field, gradually coming to a halt. Think about that, and I'll tell you the answer. And so the answer is B. <clears throat> when you kick the ball, you're applying a forward force to it, and it's speeding up. So that's positive work. Uh, if you're just carrying the ball at a constant speed, that's zero work. And if the ball rolls along coming to a stop, you'd say the earth does, uh, does negative work on the ball because it's slowing it down. Okay, so uh, work can be characterized using the scalar product. Uh, scalar product of two vectors, a and b, is, de is defined as the magnitudes, the, you multiply the magnitudes, a times b, times cosine theta, where theta is the angle between the two vectors. So, uh, and work is the scalar product of the force times the displacement. So these are both vectors. You can say that's the magnitude of the force times the magnitude of the uh, displacement times the cosine of the angle between uh, f and delta r. Okay, next section is work as an integral. So here we want to think about uh, a force component in the x direction versus uh, x. And in a general case, it could be variable. So it could be going up and smoothly varying like this. So how do you compute the work in this, in this case? Well, you could approximate what's going on here as being a lot of segments where you have a constant force. So between uh, these two distances, the force is approximately down here. Between these distances, the force is about up here, and then it's about up here, about up here, and you can basically take the areas of all these rectangles and add them all up, and you'll approximately get the, the work done for this entire distance. And you can make smaller and smaller rectangles and get a better approximation to the area of that curve. And if you, if you know calculus, you can do an integral and get the exact value for the area under this curve. And that's, uh, that's the work. So work is the definite integral from x1 to x2 of the force in the x direction uh, dx. Integration is the opposite of differentiation. So integrals of simple fu functions are readily evaluated. For, for example, if you've got a polynomial, some x to the power n, we can compute the integral, there's the integral sign of x to the power n dx as uh, evaluated from x1 to x2 is going to be uh, x to the n plus 1 divided by n plus 1. And we evaluate that from uh, x, x1 to x2, meaning that first you plug in x2 uh, to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 minus x1 to the n plus 1 over n plus 1. Okay, let's do a, a concrete example of that. So if you have a spring attached to a mass or something, um, that spring will exert a force. If you displace it towards the right, the spring will exert a force towards the left. But if you are applying a force in order to pull that mass this direction, 
you apply a force F and the mass gets displaced by a distance X. So the agent stretching the spring exerts a force of F, uh, F equals plus K times X. So to find the work, you can no longer use work equals force times distance because this is not a constant force. The further you pull it, the harder you have to pull. So you have to use an integral in this case. Work is equal to the integral of f uh, dx. Uh, so that's equal to the integral uh, from 0 to x of kx dx. You can pull out the k, integral uh, from 0 to x of x. x is x squared over 2. Uh, from 0 to x, so it's just 1 half k x squared minus 0. So the work you do there is 1 half k times x squared. And graphically, the integral is the area under the force versus distance curve. So in the case of doing work on the spring, uh, the force uh, starts at 0 and is going up to k times x. Uh, so this is a triangle that has a height of kx and a base of x. So it's 1 half base times height. So it's 1 half kx times x or 1 half kx squared. So that's just the uh, geometric way of evaluating a simple integral. So if we have multiple dimensions, like if you're going along a path from point A to point B and here we, we see the xy plane, here's y and here's x, and here's some arbitrary force, uh, the integral for the work becomes a line integral where we define this uh, in little displacement dr as being a vector. So for every little step you do f dot dr and you integrate um, from initial position r1 at a to final position r2 at b. Okay, so work done against gravity. Imagine this car or the engine or I guess the static friction force is doing work on the car to get it up the hill. So gravity is only vertical, so only the y component of the force here uh, will do work against gravity. So for every little, uh, little triangle, every little step, delta r, there's a delta x, which doesn't do work against gravity, and there's a delta y, which does do uh, work against gravity. And if you add up all the little delta y's, you get h, the total height that you've traveled. So the work done by an agent lifting an object of mass m against gravity depends only on the vertical distance h. Uh, work is mg, which was that gravity force, times h. The work is positive if you are raising the object up, and negative if you're lowering the object down. Okay, so we've heard of net force. There's also something called uh, net work. So so far we've talked about the work done by a particular force acting on an object, but there may be lots of forces acting on the object, and in, if you want to compute the net work, the net work is the work done by the net force. So, and it turns out that net work always changes the speed of an object. Remember that the net force is equal to the mass times the acceleration, so if there is some net force on an object, it will be changing its speed, and so uh, you'll have net work. So now we can apply Newton's second law uh, to the net work and get the work energy theorem. The net work is the integral of the net force times dx. Uh, this could be the integral of ma, because f equals ma, dx. And acceleration is the time derivative of the velocity, so dv by dt times dx. And now we're going to use a trick where we'll, where we'll just treat dv and dx as if they're little uh, things to be multiplied, we can transpose the um, order in which we multiply them. So the net work is dx dead by dt times dv, and dx by dt is the velocity. So it's mv dv. And we can evaluate that last integral between the initial and final velocities of mv dv. That's v to the power 1, so it's just going to be uh, m times v squared over 2, from evaluated from v1 to v2. Plug that in, which you get 1 half mv2 squared minus 1 half mv1 squared. So this quantity, whatever 1 half mv squared is, changes only when the network is done in the object, and the change in this quantity is equal to the network. So we can take that 1 half mv squared and give it its own name. Let's call it kinetic energy. 
Kinetic energy is the energy of motion. It depends on the mass of the object and the square of the speed, and there's that equation we derived in the previous slide, k equals one half mv squared. Basic idea is that if this car is going twice as fast, it has four times as much uh, kinetic energy. And then, so our work energy theorem now looks like this. The change in the kinetic energy uh, is equal to the net work. Okay. So the last section, 6.5, is on power. Power is a measure of how fast work is done. So you have a lot of power in lifting this rocket uh, up into the air. Um, so, because it's going very fast. That it, you get a lot of MGH and a lot of velocity in a short time interval. So it's work done divided by the time interval. Uh, the units of power are gonna be joules per second. This also has its own special name. It's named after James Watt and other James. Um, and so one uh, joule per second is equal to one watt. Uh, you can sometimes hear about kilowatts. Kilowatts is a thousand watts, obviously. So example, uh, you use more power running up the stairs than you would climbing the same stairs slowly. Same uh, change in energy, but uh, shorter time means a higher power. Twice the power of an engine can do twice the work of one engine in the same amount of time, or the same amount of work of one engine in half the time. And so uh, there was an old unit of power called the horsepower. Horsepower is defined as 746 watts, and that's what you normally see as the number on the back of outboard engines on, on boats is the amount of power that engine can produce in horsepowers. So uh, there's an interesting equation, last thing from chapter six, is that the infinitesimal work done over a very small distance is dw. If you divide both sides by dt, you get the power, dw by dt, is equal to the force times dr by dt. But dr by dt is just the velocity. So the dot product of the force on an object times the velocity is equal to the, the power of the work done by that force. Let's do a quick example of that. Uh, you're riding your nine kilogram bicycle, so let's draw the bicycle there, nine kilograms, at a steady 4.4 meters per second, so it's V equals 4.4, uh, that's a constant. You experience an eight newton force from air resistance. If your mass is 66 kilograms, what power must you supply? So let's draw a free body diagram of the bike. Uh, there will be an upward normal force from the ground on the bike. There will be a downward force of gravity from the earth on the bike. Those will uh, cancel. The backward force of 8.2 newtons from air resistance. And you have a forward force, uh, F. And since it's not accelerating, the forward force must balance this backward force plus 8.2. So now we just simply use power as F uh, times V. It's 8.2 times 4.4. Uh, that's 36. And it was newtons times meters per second. Newton meter is a joule, so that's 36 joules per second, or 36 watts. So it's as simple as that. So that's it for chapter six, and I will see you in class.